I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Bomber Liston, seven-time All-Ireland winner. Uh, Bomber, I was looking into, into your nickname, and obviously it's well known at this stage that it's uh, down to Gerard Muller, who scored 10 goals in the 1970 um, World Cup. Did you actually look that similar to him? What, did you have a beard when you were a young fella? I didn't have a beard when I was a young fella, but I was a pudgy, small, pudgy, lazy fella that you'd hang around the square. We used to play soccer on the beach in Bellybunia when the tide was out. Every Saturday, especially, they'd be about 30 of us down there and had some great games. And I used to be hanging around the square and wasn't much good, but was able to get a, a, a few goals. And um, at that time, he was a, a goal scorer and he was small and pudgy. And I'd say that that's kind of where it came from. Yeah. And then there was that strange incident in 2018 when you were on a plane about to go from Cork to Cardiff, was it, when the, the nickname came against you? That's, that's right, yeah. David Morton, Stag Party. Um, we all went over to um, Cheltenham and it was on the way back. Um, one of David's friends who was, who was teaching here in Tralee just was trying to get my attention. He was two or three seats back and he was shouting, Bomber, Bomber, Bomber! And he had, he had his phone kind of with a charger up in the desk and the air hostess was just passing and she just had this fellow roaring bomber and looked at this kind of a battery on the desk and she got an awful fright and he tried to explain to her and she wasn't having it and she went in and complained to the captain and he was asked to hang on when the flight gets over to, to wait to be last off the plane and I, I just stayed on with him and the captain went in and um, he went into the captain's and the door was open and I was just there waiting to verify his story. And they Googled, they Googled on list in any way and the captain read it and um, he just got a bit of a telling off and, and um, that, was, that was it really. And coming in then, um, the passport please, when I, when I came in, uh, your man said, geez, Bomber, you're, you're always causing trouble down here in Cork. Like, you know, to just, it got, got legs after that, but that, that's what happened. Yeah, and um, have they stopped calling you a bomber since? I, it's, it's part of your identity at this stage. Yes, yeah, there, there's more people calling me a bomber than no one anyway, I'd say, you know? Yeah, yeah it's, it's almost unusual. When I called you up about this interview, I kind of almost thought it'd be weird to call you Owen because I just assumed that that's just yeah. what you go by. But, that yeah. doesn't bother me anyway, yeah. Yeah, I was looking over your career there and... You had two debuts in your career in a way with Kerry. So 1978 against Cork, but also 1993 against Cork. Because, you know, you came back after a couple of years away. Um, but they were very, very different. One as a young fella, one far more mature sort of fella. Could you compare and contrast the, the bomber in 78 versus 93? I could, yeah. The, the first, my first championship match, I was to play against Waterford in 78. That would have been my first championship match, but we had to play a club match the night before then. You know, so I was playing a club match the night before the Munster final. It sounds bizarre now, like, but I twisted my ankle. So I wasn't able to play against Waterford that night. So my first championship match was against Cork, um, down in Park O'Keeve. And um, I was marking Eugene Desmond, um, he had played with UCC and um, uh, things, things went good enough for me. I, I played well enough and that was my, my, my first championship match. My second time round, I had retired in, after coming back from Australia with the Irish team in 1990. I said that would be a nice way to finish. So I didn't play in 91 and 92. And then my mate, uh, Ogie Morton, uh, was manager and... He said to me, do you know what this team could do with a, a full forward? Is there any way you... I said, look. He said, Jesus, oh, again. I'm... He said, look, would you know what? He said, wouldn't you just train? We'll keep it quiet. No one will know. We'll just see if you can get back into shape. Even if I had you there as a sub. And so I remember that Christmas, I went down and went for a run. I knew what times the lads were running, like down around the goals and back. And I remember that Christmas day I went down after the dinner. And Jesus, uh, the lads were able to do it in 40-something seconds. And um, 
Jeez, I was back in about 65 seconds anyway. I said, Jesus, no, I'll have another go. I gave myself a good rest and had another cut at it anyway. About 62 seconds. And I said, geez, I'll have one last go anyway. And came home in the state of depression, rang Ogie. I said, Ogie, this isn't going to work at all. Like, you know, and he said, look, you can't. Just keep, stick with it for a while. Train, train, and no one will know. And we'll have a look at it in a, in a, in a, in a few weeks. So, Jesus, it got to the papers anyway. Somewhere, Tom, Tom Reardon um, had got hold of it through someone. And Jesus, I was at a stage there where I wanted to pack it in at that stage. I couldn't be seen to be a quitter after getting all this publicity. So I trained every single night in January, every night in February, missed one night in March. And I got to the stage where in the runs, I was able to pick off a few of the lads, you know? So everything was going great until the Tuesday night before the Munster final. I was knocking Stephen Stack, shooting out for a ball, and I thought he was after kicking me. I, my hamstring went. And I remember I got a, got a, um, they had this special kind of a, a, a rod or a machine anyway, they, they would numb it. And, but I tried it anyway in the Munster final and uh, Ogie took me off at half time anyway. And uh, which I give him, I keep keep reminding him of it that, that all my years Nico never took me off and geez the one chance you had with me you 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 lost faith. But um, they were the two the two anyway. So as Mark and Niall Cahillan, he gets a good thrill out of it anyway. So that I only lasted a half a half a match against him, against the the good fullbacks that I only lasted half the match. But uh, so they were two, two contrasting uh, matches anyway for me. Absolutely. I was like, I actually found an interview you did in April 1993 coming up to that game. And the quote you came out with is, I'm not winning the battle for fitness, but I'm not losing it either. <laughs> I've no recollection of that now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How, how old were you when you were finishing up um, in 1993 or coming back? I was, I was 36. 36, yeah. And did, did the people of Kerry think this is madness bringing back a lad at 36 who hasn't played for a couple of seasons? I don't know that really. Um, like some did, I'd say, and some. I was playing, playing good enough club football at the time, and you know, I obviously had to prove myself to to get on the team. That that through club matches and through training, I was must have been able to hold my own inside in training. Like because everyone, all the team, the manager, selectors, they all know whether a fellow was up there or not. You know, mm. but I got into. I'd say I came from about 17 and a half stone down to about 16 two. So that was not bad, no. There was a lot of effort, a lot of sweat, but it was a shame that hamstring went for sure. Because that's no regret stuff for having a cut. You you were in the crowd for the game, the famous game against Clear the year before, weren't you? That's right, yeah. My my dad and myself. We were at the match. At that stage, you had fully retired and you weren't thinking about going back at that stage, were you? No. Fan. Had you adjusted to the mode of being a fan? Absolutely. Yeah, because you no. hear some people talk about how for a couple of years after they can't really go to matches or they go to matches and they're fired up because they think they should be out there. Oh, Jeannie, no, no. Um, I was quite delighted to be, to be a fan. Uh, you still enjoy the matches and enjoy the discussions after, but knowing that you didn't have to train if you could go to the pub and have the, have the crack after, Jesus, I really enjoyed that side of it. Yeah, um, I actually also in that interview from 1993, there was talk of some exercise equipment you had, List and Limber, it was called. Can That's you right. Yeah. That? But that was, um, I had been out to Australia and I'd seen this kind of a, um, a fitness thing that I reckon that would be right good for every GA club. Do you know, there was one half, I, I kind of picked what I thought was good out of it and I, I designed it in such a way that half it was where you do all your stretching and flexibility, which wasn't being done in the GA at that time. And the other half is where you do all your strength training, where you do your pull-ups, push-ups, the dips, you know. And I used to teach biology and I had a, an interest in, in, in that side of it. And... Uh, eventually got it, I put two or three years researching it, got it to the stage where it could be manufactured, got everything right, and 
sold three or four of them and just didn't like the thing of going around asking people to buy them, do you know? But um, you would still see things like it now um, around some parks, you know, where, to, where you do this, but it was all competing against your own body weight. Mm. So that's where that came from, listing limber. Yeah, and I'd say when you were gone up to 17 stone, it was no fun trying to, trying to work on that, that equipment. <laughs> it was that, no. Um, <laughs> competing against that body weight like you know. <laughs> <laughs> if, we, if we jump all the way back to like I was reading a, a piece you did about four years ago in the independent and you were talking about your relationship with Miko and that it began in 1977 when he was under 21 boss over in Valley Longford I believe is the, f- the first place you had a game maybe against Clare was it that's right yeah um I was marking uh Hurty was his name uh there was four brothers there and our curate in, in Ballybunion um, was their uncle. And we, we, we had gone over to play them as Shannon Rangers would go across the river there and play Kilrush. And um, so, but that day I was uh, picked as a sub. It was my first time being picked in the carry under 21 team. I was picked as a sub. And Sean Welsh, for some reason, I don't know, was it an injury or what, but he, 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 he didn't turn up. And um, I was picked corner forward. And um, I knew the pitch. I was very familiar with the pitch because I'd have often played there. They would have, very one in Arbale and very Longford would have been rivals. And um, we'd be playing together then as Shannon Rangers. So I was very familiar with the pitch. Had done a lot of training there and played well that day. And I remember I was moved out midfield with Jacko. And I linked up well with Jacko. I remember in that match, and Miko brought me in training uh, then after that. Right, okay. And did you did you kind of feel like you settled quite quickly once you were calling up, called up to the senior panel? Sorry, uh, did I settle quickly, is it? Yeah, do you feel you settled quickly, you know, you were an under-21 and then you were brought into the senior panel. Did you, did yeah. you settle quickly? That was, that was 1977, so I had the benefit of a full year training inside there and getting into shape because I wasn't in good shape. So I had a full year of where I was just had 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 Miko as a personal trainer down in in, in Waterville and he was training me in there and um I didn't have any pressure of having to play matches except the under twenty ones. And it was a great foundation for me really. Like geez eventually as the year went by you saw Jesus, I, I won a lot of ball off John O'Keefe or I won a lot of ball off Jimmy Dean and tonight. You know, you were marking good players like and Jesus, you were getting more ballers. You were getting better and getting fitter and that's where the confidence comes from then, you know? Yeah, because you took a teaching post down in Waterville, which is where Mick O'Dwyer is from. So your relationship would have really grown because he was there, like you say, a bit like a personal trainer. He also put a car under your, under your backside, didn't he? He did, in fairness to him, uh, without um, I was, um, get a, I'd walk up to, from, from the digs, I was staying in Cronin's down in Waterford, and I'd walk up to school every morning with my school bag to the real village schoolmaster, like, you know. And uh, eventually, after a few weeks, Miko said, look, there's a, a nice car there, take it away. I said, geez, Mick, I can't afford that at all. And he said, look, pay me when you have it there. That's how much it is worth, and... Um, pay me when you have it. So I got a lovely feet one two eight. That was the start of the players getting the cars. I was the first player to get a car. <laughs> I was in the wires garage in Waterville, <laughs> and the wires undertakers in Waterville, and the wires hotels in Waterville. I was representing all that, like you know, I was his ambassador. <laughs> so with my feet one two eight, yeah. <laughs> but I, yeah. I can I think you tell I, me about? I, I, I think I paid him for it at some stage, uh, anyway. Yeah, because it sounds like some of the stories, like playing cards and, and this kind of stuff, that he'd, if he beats you in cards, he might produce the tenor later on and, and show you what he's won at. The best, the best one was the night we were playing poker, and Mick had come up with from the drawings from the, from the pub, and he'd have all the two shillings and a half a crown that time, and shillings and that. And we used to play for that big money, but... Miko was, we knew Miko was coming and um, he was down, we were playing, next thing Miko went out to do and I, I fixed all the cards and told him, just keep betting and remember how much you put in. So there was five of us playing 
keep betting and I'd fix the cards that I'd get a house of aces and he'd get a house of kings. <laughs> well, you should have seen the reaction. Here, everyone knowing what was going on and fellas betting and making the pot bigger and Mick fills his cards and every one of us knowing he had a house of kings. And he'd chat in a way as if he had no interest in the game and he'd talking about football. We all know that he was just trying to let on he had nothing. But Tim came to the betting and the lads dropped out and I kept raising him and raising him. He was only bluffing and raising him. And eventually, <laughs> eventually anyway, he says, am I bluffing? There's a house of kings. Ah, oh, Jeannie, I thought you were bluffing. He was just going for the pot. And I says, hold it, Mick. House of Aces. <laughs> Took all the money. I was afraid to give him the money back until the half training was over. Because I knew he'd, he'd just murder me, like, you know. But uh, we had happy days down there. Really great, great crack. Yeah. And, and how long before you told him? I was only talking to him last night, actually. Um, he's in great form anyway still. And, and it was great, great hours to give him an old chat and trip down memory lane. Mm. And uh, is, how's he getting on, actually? Yeah, is he, like, great, yeah. yeah. He's very good. Cocooning at the moment, I said to just that his his grand his two granddaughters are down there and they can't go into the house, and but apart from that, he's he's, he's getting on with. Mm. And and yourself, how are you finding the days? No problem at all. I'm I'm still working. I do over the phone. I'm a financial advisor. I have my own business here in in Trudy, Maguire Liston, and. Um, Things are going grand, really. You know, you're, you're just making sure the stuff that was in the pipeline that it's getting done. But we're still open for business, but it's it's going to get quiet now for 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 a while. But um, finding it grand, really. Mm. Um, you know, you the weather. Once the weather stays fine, it isn't too bad. Like you know. Yeah, it's true. But, uh, but I'd love love to get back to any bit of golf again, and but it's good that you can get out for an old walk anyway. You know. Mm. It's funny you bring up the golf because that's another thing that yourself and Mikko would have done or he would have been fiercely competitive with. Oh, fiercely competitive. Like we, we that time we used, there was a program on television that time, Superstars, where you'd pick six different sports. And that time we'd, I'd be challenging him to different things. Like we'd play golf together, we'd play handball together, we'd play badminton, we'd play snooker, darts, fielding, fella kicking out a ball between us. We had our own superstars down there, like, you know. But he was a tiny bit better than me in most things. He was a better golfer. He was a better handballer. He, even jumping at the ball, I was 21, he was 42. And that time, fellow kicking out the ball, he'd win as many off me as I'd win off him. Like, no, he'd put his hands into your eyes and everything to win it. He was the most competitive man you ever met, like, you know. He hated to lose. Whether it was pitch and toss, he hated to lose. Um, but oh, we had some great, great fun and great battles. Now, was that kind of the making of you too? Because, you know, catching a high ball is, you know, ends up being your bread and butter. But the fact that you're competing with a man twice your age, a, a competitive person, a brilliant footballer, a brilliant manager, that must have been the making of you. I'd say I learned a bit more though, about competing against Sean O'Keefe, who was who was in his prime at that time and was the best fullback that I'd ever played on. And, you know, most of the nights you'd be in there with high balls coming in, you wouldn't get it, you wouldn't get a ball. Mm. Do you know, he was just so, he had a fantastic stand and jump and so strong and, oh God, he was, he was the king of fullbacks, like, you know, which was a great place to learn. No, Miko, you'd learn the dark arts of Miko about what you can do to spoil a fella. Uh, and, and get your percentage of the ball, like, you know? Because when I, when I read Miko's autobiography, Blessed and Obsessed, it just seemed like torture, some of the things you were doing, running up and down the sand dunes. But was it torture plus fun, or, or how do you remember it? Oh, torture. Torture. The training. I, I wasn't an athlete, really, like, you know, and didn't like... I was good for a burst. Across the field, one burst across the field, or over and back, but this long running... And but Jesus, um, he was into that laps, 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 and he called for me, and I knew then if I didn't go for the run with him, he'd kill me altogether the following night. So I, I was a kind of a fellow that liked to spread the pain, like not have it a bit bad most days rather than murdered, like you know. So, um, but uh, but it gave a great foundation, like you know, 
uh, that type of training. And then, in fairness, come the summer, it was all football we were playing, you know, and just speed work, which was a pleasure. And you really enjoyed it. And that's where the fun was. But the winter, uh, we, well, we'd only start, I'd say, around March. Um, so we, we were off October, November, December, January and February. So we had five months off to have cracked, like, you know, which was brilliant uh, compared to the players now, like, you know. Mm. And then you start feeling guilty in f- the end of February, like knowing that this, not really guilty, but knowing the torture that was ahead of you and you'd be trying to get into some little bit of shape that you wouldn't be murdered altogether or having to suffer too much. But, so that was the, it was all part of it. But looking back in it, it is great, you know. You, great you, you were part of a group that were referred to as the heavies, were you? Was it the fatties or the heavies? Uh, yeah. <laughs> they were, they John Egan, Tim Kennelly, Paddy Shea, myself, Sean Welch. We were the, we were definitely the 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 main committee of that of that group. Um, there was a, he'd bring in Ogie and I then he'd bring in Mick Spillane just at the hair, you know, to to really just show us that we weren't that there was another level there, like you know, mm. but. Um, uh, that was when the real hard stuff, like, you know, but, like, that, that was the thing that Miko had best, like, he knew what fellas needed piles of training, and he knew what fellas needed very little, like, Powery and Ogie and John O'Keefe, they, they all kept themselves immaculate, like, you know, all year round, so, um, we were the fellas that used to leave ourselves go a bit, like, you know. <laughs> Did you watch Miko's, um, the documentary on RT a couple of years ago, and did it bring back memories? I did. <laughs> it brought back a lot of memories, yeah. yeah. Uh, about the Mars bars and the Smarties, and uh, uh, he was... Uh, I did a, a course, like, you know, it was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was hard to believe, like, 1978, do you know how many years? It was 42 years ago now since I went down to Waterville, like, and it just went like that, you know, it is... It is but that's life, sure. Yeah, true, true. He um, is, is when he was giving you the personal training. Like there was also a talk, or you wrote in that article about one day you've been out on a night out with the teachers, and you tried to pretend you weren't there the next morning, but he sort of sniffed you out. That's that's right. Yeah, my landlady used cover for me. In fairness, I, I had on my side, and of course he 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 knew everything that was going on in Waterville, so. I went to bed anyway after school and uh, Miko arrived down to bring me out training and I had taught her to tell him that I was gone, that I was gone for a run myself. Like, but So he just waited and waited, tried to go out the back door and to come in late. And I was after coming back and, come on, come on, he said, we have to go for a run. So we went for the run anyway and it was down the, over by the golf course in Waterford, we'd run. And oh, I sweated and sweated, and but you know what? He he was driving it on like you know he was still twenty one years older than me like, but he was he never drank, never smoked, ran every day. He was an athlete like you know, mm. but geez, anyway, we were coming back up the first hole. This would have been about three or four weeks before the monster final. We were coming back up the first anyway, and. With about three or four hundred yards to go, I said, I'll show him no. And just out of stubbornness and pig headedness, I took off from him and left him um, and driving on. And next thing I stepped into something, I twisted my ankle and he went down roaring. And he went by me, up, touched the fence where we were to finish, came back, bet you put me up on his back, took me down to the water and had me walking up and down in the sea there, trying to get the swelling down. But that was just how competitive he was. Like, it was, it was a case of beat the race, win the race first and then look after your player that you might be needing in a few weeks for a monster final. Like. Would you have ever seen him play or were you too young to have seen him play? I would. I was at the 1972 All-Ireland Final. He was playing that day. Um, I was 14 years old, it was Kerry and Offaly. I was up at that match and I remember him. And I remember him himself and Mick O'Connell came to Belly Bunyan to open the pitch at some stage. And I remember him there. But like himself and Mick O'Connell, they were two gods to us. Like the only sport that we really were into 
bit of soccer on the beach, but football was the was the sport. And here were two icons coming to our town and our pitch, and God, we were down there watching every move. What what were they like as players? Because you know the rest of us probably wouldn't even there'd be minimal footage, we'll say. Oh, there's Miko. Miko was a fantastic footballer. Like he, I'll, I'll describe him now, Joe. He he had a pair of hands like shovels. He was a fantastic fielder of a ball. Genuinely, I was 6'3". He was about 5'10". 5'10", I'd say, max. And would be able to get up off the ground, like, and woeful strength. He was working the garage and at one stage, and he had big claws and big forearms and strength. And the most competitive man you'd ever meet, like, you know? You coming out, anything, once that ball was in, like, he'd kill to, to get that ball. And he had fantastic stamina, lacking a bit of pace. That was the only thing. He, he, he didn't have an extra pace, but played fantastic football wing back for Kerry. But one of the best, Mick O'Connell used to even say the best right foot in the game that time, 40 years ago. And you look at his scoring stats. What a kicker. He tried to get me kicking frees and teach me the, the art of it. He was the most beautiful fella to go for a kick with because... He, whatever way he was kicking, he'd kick it with backspin. And it's just a lovely floating ball. To be like, you know, you play football, a drop kick. You know, it's lovely to jump to time going up for a drop kick because the ball just floats. He could do that from his hands, that lovely backspin with a, with, with a football. But just fabulous kicker, competitor, brilliant footballer. Mick O'Connell was, was an artist then. He had just a a classier way of, of jumping for things and a classier way of kicking it, you know, off his hands. But Jesus, they were so far ahead of everyone at that time. Like, they were full-time athletes that time. They used to come up to play against the, the senior team inside in uh, Killarney. The senior team there, they take one aside and join in with the lads. They were just so mad for football and mad for training. But that's, they, were, they were great role models anyway for fellas growing up in Kerry that time. No doubt about it. And Mick O'Connell, of course, rowing back to Valencia Island after winning all Ireland. That kind of, that's the sort of stuff that in a hundred years time they'll be like it, it just won't even seem like anything related to reality. It, it almost doesn't even at the moment. Yeah, it is and it is all true, like, you know. Um it's just brilliant. Like and I remember that book was one of the first and only books I read for years um, was about the life story of Mick O'Connell and all that was in it, you know, which was great. Um, Did you look at the, you know, when you were, had all those classic matches against Dublin, which are just part of GEA folklore at this stage, did you ever get to a stage where, you know, Mick was your man and you almost hated Kevin Heffernan, we'll say, and Heffo's army, this sort of stuff, because, you know, <coughs> The dubs in Kerry, it's like almost a clash of cultures, the city boys against the, you know, the countrymen. Yeah, when I came in, like, Kerry had won 75, they'd lost 76. I was there as a sub in 77. I was number 24 that day. And that was a classic match. Kerry were winning and next thing the dubs came at the end and pipped us. And, you know, it was a really, really good game of football. Um, then in 78, if you were after losing to a team in 76 and 77, geez, old lads, that, that year really put in huge effort. Like, there was, and was there hate? There was, that time. Have no doubt about it. Um, it's an awful hard word to use, but anyone that has played at that top level, the elite level, you just have to get into that to be ruthless and to get into that frame of mind that like this fella is coming against you and to win that all out of medal you have to beat him and you know that's the mentality of when you're in the arena and Mick uh, Kevin Heffernan Jesus he was a fella that was could take all this off you you know and have no doubt about it but um I got to know Kevin though after and uh it all, you'll be saying, Jesus, what were we thinking? What was it all about? Like, when you look back at it, so we're great friends with all the dubs now, like, you know. But at that time, we'd have cut the head off them, and they'd have cut the head off us, like, just as easy, you know. To, and it was a way dirtier game 
in those days. Like you get the head taken off you with elbows. When I meet Sean Doherty now, I say, Sean, how are you? And he said, good, 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 Bob. You know, but that, that's the way the game was that time, like, you know. Yeah, because I, I always thought from your point of view, you must have looked at the likes of Tony Hanahoe. Probably not the most stylish footballer in the world, but he wins in All Ireland. And then the following year, I think he was still 28, and he he manages the team after Perfo leaves to win All Ireland. Yeah. I mean that that yeah. was unbelievable goal. Yeah, he was player manager and what a leader. And Jesus, you know, we got to know him very well and a good friend now. But you can just see to do that, it just takes a special man to do that. Mm. And he he got that team just went straight in, did it. He's way played and managed. Uh, it d- doesn't get enough of publicity, really, you know. What an achievement, you know. And um, But, you know, th- that was a fabulous Dublin team. But we, they were, when I was coming, they were coming towards the end when I was kind of coming in 78, like, you know. But they could very easily have won that match, though, in 78. You look at that first half again before the... The, the goal, say the first 25 minutes of that match, if a television broke down, you would have said, geez, Dublin will win this by 15 points. But things things just changed, you know? Yeah, but to score 3-2, like, I mean, uh, you must have been a proud man walking back to Bale after scoring 3-2. I was, but the most important thing was, being honest, the only thing that mattered was that I actually had won an all Ireland medal. God, that that was something that I just wanted to do at that stage when you were putting in so much effort. When you were putting in so much effort, um, just to win an All Ireland medal was what it was about. And having my 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 friend as the captain, Ogie, and we from the same town, and bringing that cup back to the Belly Bunyan, and going into every house in the, in the parish when we were out in the ran on St Stephen's Day, and bringing the cup in and seeing the reaction, God. Money couldn't buy that. Did you go out in the ring together, singing and going in with yeah. a pot? Our local GA club used to go out uh, fundraising for the club. We'd have about 30 of us um, and all over the parish, uh, the country. You'd, you'd do the town at night time, the, the pubs, but you'd do all the, 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 the houses in the parish and to have the Sam Maguire Cup in in, in at Christmas 78 and bring it into every house and to see the reaction there, uh, it was fantastic. And were you collecting money in the cup? Was that what you used as the... As yeah, the... You'll, you'll be collecting money. We'd, we'd have our appointed collectors. We'd have two or three or four going around with bags while we were playing and roaring and singing and shouting and blagarding. Uh, of the people that would be going around collecting then, like, you know, but all the money then you'd go to the, to the Bale GA club. And were you singing or were you playing an instrument? I was playing the accordion. Oh, very I, good. I, I three tunes in the accordion. <laughs> what were they? Um, Machine Durkin, um, uh, Wooden Heart, and <laughs> um, some horn pipe, the Belfast horn pipe. Right, okay. Uh, do you keep it up to this day? I, it's inside there. I, not time I'd pull it out there just for a, a, a tune, uh, <laughs> but I'm very rusty. Yeah, if only I'd known that beforehand, I might have tried to convince you to bring it out. Um, I'd I, I go in and get it, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> do, you have, um, do you have any days that, that gave you most joy on the field? I mean, scoring 3-2 in an All-Ireland final is surely up there, but is, does that else come to mind? The, what gave me most joy out of the football was the trips to Australia and the trips to America with your teammates um, and with the Irish team there who you got to know some great friends, Tony Scullion and Stephen O'Brien and uh, Bernard Flynn. You know, great, great friendships, you know, when you travel abroad like that with people and that you're living with them for three or four weeks. Great. Um, that'd be great, great memories I'd, I'd have. And, and funny enough, when you get fit, going into training with your teammates, Jesus, playing football, you know, when you're in, in, in good shape, and going in there for a challenge against your mates, Jesus, that was that was fantastic as well. Yeah. Mm. Wait, really. when, when you win four All Irelands in a row coming into '82, 
do you kind of almost feel like we're fairly invincible here? You know, Cork weren't putting up a great challenge in Munster either. <coughs> Cork often put up, Cork put up a lot of good challenge at that time. They beat us in the league final in, in one of the time. They was often close. We'd beat them well sometimes. They'd be only pointing it another time. So we had, they kept us on our toes. We knew that if we lost to Cork that time, you had no second chance, no back door. There was an awful lot. That was the most nerve-wracking game of all. It was grand. When you get to the final, you had the whole fun of the year, only to finish it off. Whereas, God, if you lose the Munster final, it is a long summer. You're looking at the enemy getting all the highlights and the fun out of it. And um, it's not a nice place to be. Mm. Yeah, we lost in the 83. 83, I think, was my, my first time losing to Cork, yeah. Um, they got a goal in the last minute down in Park O'Keeve, a good, uh, and um, they were beaten after by Dublin. But uh, Cork had some very good footballers and great teams that time. And with Billy Morgan there, that lovely madness that he has that, uh, you know, would drive his players. And, and we had some great battles with them. It was, it was a it was a different era too because I, I interviewed Billy Morgan, must have been a couple of years ago, and he was telling me about a club final that he played with Nemo Rangers against uh, Scottstown in Croke Park and that it was so cold, I think there was a fog. He actually had to have, um, I think it was a, a glass of port just to warm him up before it came. <laughs> Not really the done thing now. No, we, we used to, Miko wouldn't allow that at all, no. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> <June>. <laughs> um, no. Uh, it was all, all serious preparation with Miko. Yeah. Do, do you remember the lead into that Offaly game in 82? How, you know, I mean, what the mood was like in the camp? Like, I, I had gone in, I hadn't experienced losing in All-Ireland at that stage. I had done four, played four, won four. I thought this was going to go on indefinitely, like, you know. Um, I remember we had, we had trained hard for that. Um, we had... We had the fantastic trip to Australia in 81, which really bonded us together, like, you know. In 82, there was talks of another trip to, to Bali, I think um, we were talking about, uh, as the lad said after, to Bali Bun, and we ended up in, like, you know, that Bali. <laughs> but um, that, that 82, like, that, that was a fabulous Offaly team. If you just look at the, the forward line, even, like, you had Matt Connor, Johnny Mooney, Sean Lowry, Jerry Carroll, Guyne, and you had you had um, Richie Connor and the two Connors midfield. Now, to mind the half back line there that they have Pat Fitzgerald and geez, they, they had a series series uh, team, and they had gone a step further every year. You know, won a lost the Leinster, won a Leinster, lost the semi final, won a final. Lost an All Ireland final and came back and won it. Geez, that's a sign of a great coach, Eugene McGee, sign of great players that just learnt and went one step further every time. So couldn't begrudge him that win. Beat mm -hmm. us fair and fair. Um, would love to have got a second goal if we got a draw even out of it. Would love, like the way the dogs got the, the draw this time. Geez, I would love to have had a second goal, but that's, that's the way, sure. I was going to ask you about that, but a word on Matt Connor. Like when I saw the, the limited amount of footage that I've seen of him, he was really graceful. He looked a bit like a Kerry footballer in an Offaly jersey. Just how good was he? He was absolutely brilliant. Had everything left and right. He scored was it two eight against against Kerry in in in, in the semi final the year before. Um, Marking good players like you, marking Mick Spillane and John O'Keefe, you know, good, sticky, fast. What? Class and turning a sixpence right, left, just beautiful port, a poetry. Um, just like he, he had everything, um, was, would, would make any team mm. a super. Do, do you have a, a sort of an image in your mind of the lead up to that goal from Seamus Derby? I do. I was. He, I was. I remember at that stage. 
Jesus, we were we were trying to to to. We panicked a bit. We try became a bit too defensive. Jesus, you were I was above it full forward. I remember and. There wasn't ball wasn't coming up for a while and it was gone fairly close at this stage. They had pulled back a point, they had pulled back another point, and there was only two points in it. And I remember I was being dragged out. I was saying, "Geez, will I go to try and win a ball at midfield?" Which Miko had given me the license to do that, you know. If uh, and I said, "Will I go out and put?" I can see on the left hand corner there jumping for the ball and turning and shooting it into the right. But uh, we still felt we had time enough to to get it back. Like, And I remember Tom Spillane shooting down under the stand and I was running right through the middle on my own. And I often think after if he'd seen me and gave it, and I went straight through and put it wide. <laughs> I'd be the cause of the five in a row. But uh, I sure you, you've all this in your head. But it's tis, tis, tis great to be able to. When you'll never be bored then you with all these matches and and incidents that inside in the head that you can recall, like you know. Is it something that took you a while to to get over, or are you the sort of person who's like, Ash, it's only football. We'll go on and we'll play again, and then you you go and win more All Ireland. No, it wasn't just awful football. Awful disappointing. Really, my first experience of losing in Ireland. Really, I'd say there was a tough. Two weeks in it anyway. But then I got over it. But Jesus, I was down below with Miko. It took Miko years to get over it. I know, see, so still even over it, like, you know. So, geez, I'd be out six months later, out out in the foot and green with him, and we'd be having a match. The next thing he'd walk away and he'd say, Geez, what were you doing that time, throwing the ball back under your legs there? Do you know, he'd remember an incident in. I say, Mick, get over it, get over it, it's t- t- finished now, like, you know. But Jesus, he, he found it very hard to get, you know, about two weeks, I'd say. We were blind in, looking forward into the next one. Yeah, and, like, it was a, it was a good feat to come back and win more All-Irelands. Like, you, I was looking at the, the 1985 thing, where you beat Dublin 212 to 28. And the fact that you had that photograph done with Bendix, the one where you're posing with a washing machine, and it comes out in the paper the next day, was that any sort of a gamble? Were there any conversations about whether you should or shouldn't do that? No. Miko decided he'd do it. It was a good fundraiser. It was a good Bob. He was a player's man. We'd have a trip. We'd have a few Bob on the trip. And, um, geez, we didn't even know what was happening. All of a sudden, we were in after the train station. Ned standing here for a photograph. That was the Bindex we brought in. And, fellas, there was no big deal about it at all. It was like as if it was something that just happened the whole time, you know? Yeah, I was looking at the photograph. I couldn't quite identify you in it. Are you in that photo? Oh, I'm in it all right. <laughs> <laughs> the athletes. Did you, my, did you not see my pecs there? The, the six-pack. The <laughs> I must have missed. It's on the left corner with the six-pack. <laughs> <laughs> so to, to go from winning so many to the last number of years where you weren't winning so much, and obviously you stepped away and came back. Were those last few years very difficult? Was was there much criticism around the county? They were um, difficult, have no doubt. Like losing Munster finals when you're out of it then, like in having to watch Cork go on then, like, you know, and in fairness, Cork <clears throat> and Meath were the two teams that time. They won, Meath won um, 87, 88, and then Cork won 89, 90, and like you had, Cork were in four finals there, like, you know, and they, they won two. Um, but it was a very good Cork team, like, you know, when you compare it now and look back at both teams, you would say that, you know, it wasn't like Dave Barry, Dinny Allen, uh, Tompkins, Fahey, Jesus, sure they had, they had fabulous players there, Mick McCarthy, you know, Slocum, Jesus, Cahillan still in his prime, you know, they had they had serious footballers, um, that team, and then being driven by Billy, it was no wonder that they won won won. Um, but did it hurt? Absolutely. We you're still competitive. You're you want to win every match like at that stage at that level, and when you lose a monster final to Cork, or when you lose, it hurts and it has to hurt. Otherwise, 
you should be gone, like, you know. Mm. And did was your rivalry with Cork as bitter as you, you know you described with Dublin earlier? Did you look at them the same way for a finish? Oh, geez, absolutely, absolutely. Even though my mother was from Cork, my cousins in Cork, but oh, Jesus, like they had, they were trying to take what we wanted most off us, like you know, and ruin our summer, and ruin our fun, and really like to lose a monster final, like and having the whole summer off, twiddling your thumbs, watching someone else on the stage, was was hard. And we knew that, and we prepared. In fairness, Nico prepared for Cork as if it was an All Ireland always. Mm. What were your teammates like? Who who stands out when you think about some of the? You know, you were in there from 1978 until, I mean, obviously those couple of years out, but 1993. So that would have covered a few generations of different footballers between the end of some footballers early on, and you know, <coughs> like the Seamus Moynihan would have played in 92, 93. But who comes to mind when you think you, your teammates? Well, when I think of Seamus Minehan, I think Jacko, I always reckon, was the best player that we had in our team. And the only player that I ever saw that was as good, I would say, was Seamus Minehan. What a, what a career he had. What a player. What a competitor. Absolutely fabulous. But there were some very good players there that came in, like Willie Maher, John Kennedy, Timmy Dow, John Higgins, um, George, George Lynch. Um, Tom Spillane, do you know, fellas that came in our kind of second coming when we won the three in a row, geez, they played a huge part in, in, in that, like that new energy. And uh, there was, say, maybe eight or nine of us that were there from the first, say, the four in a row. But geez, having these brilliant footballers coming in and lifting us again, you know, um, that was that was great. Like, you know, and there were some fabulous footballers in that. In that second generation that came like you know because you know we see so much over the years yeah so i played with donald like you know what a player what class um think like if he had come in 78 instead of 88 you know to think that if he had all the good footballers that i had around me if he had that god what what a player you would have seen you know morris Cotterell, was it yeah just yeah. A, Pure poetry. That's the way. It certainly wasn't prose. It was really good poetry. No, he was just fabulous, like like Matt Connor. Does David Clifford remind you of him at all? He does. Same even languid, catch, walk, relax, lay back. Until the ball is there, then you have the burst. And the most beautiful style of kicking, like, you know. Just, mm -hmm. just lovely to watch. You'll, you'll travel anywhere to see it. Pat, Pat Spillane, of course, has been a commentator on the game for many years since retiring himself. What was he like in the dressing room? Pat, <laughs> Pat was a brilliant footballer. Wasn't, um, was a fantastic athlete, a fantastic stamina, fantastic kicker of a ball. Um, would love to have his own ball. Because he didn't like to share it with the, there was a good story there between Mike Sheehy when he wasn't letting in the ball and it was a tight enough match and coming up to half time, Mikey and John Egan were getting cross and they said, Jesus, Papa, will you go and say it to him? So he came back out, he said, Jesus, come on, Pat, share it around a bit. And came out anyway. And Pat then we were waiting for the other team to come out and we were around the field and uh Pat says, um, right, Dad, we'll, we'll use the one, two now. And Mikey says, Pat, just focus on the one. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I got it point across me, you know. But it was a good job. He was so good because he won a lot of matches for us by being, you know, he, he was a little selfish, shall we say, with the ball. But it was a good job because we'd killed him otherwise, like, you know. Yeah. But he won a lot for us by, he took on shots. And delivered, so we can't be too cross with him. Yeah, Mikey Sheehy, of course, you can't but think of that lob over Paddy Cullen. Would anyone else have had the audacity to try it? Of the skill, um, Mikey was a fantastic kicker of a ball. Like you know, he could he could put it anywhere. You know, he had that skill, that soccer skill, and but to have the gumption to do it, like when you were 
we were after playing terrible for 25 minutes, like, you know, and to have the gumption to do it, he's a sure, he, he's, he's a, a competitor as well, like, you know, but I didn't even know I can remember that match. When I went in at half time, I didn't know the score and I didn't know if the goal was allowed or not. Right. Detention and first all Ireland and I didn't know what was happening. And I found out we were actually up a pint or two after playing useless. I said, hey, we must have a great chance, like, you know. And who would have been some of the best players you came up against? You, you've already mentioned Matt Connor. He was, he was a brilliant player, of course. Oh, yeah. So in, in Ross Common, Tony McManus was a fantastic forward, a fantastic footballer. Um, up north, um, Anthony Tohill, Tony Scullion from Derry, brilliant footballers. There was a McKeever, another corner back there for Derry, brilliant. Um, what other county would we go? Dublin, like Anthony O'Toole was special, like, you know. Um, Kevin Morton. Uh, Tommy Drum, uh, Robbie Kelleher, do you know, and, and that Dublin team, Mullins, Jesus, what a, what a competitor, footballer, everything, he had everything, like, you know, he, um, Cork, or oh, like Jimmy Barry Murphy, Dini Allen, the skill, Dave Barry, they had woefully skillful players, like, you know, um, Callahan would eat you, like, you know, uh, Tompkins, one of the best that ever played the game, ever. Rating that high, like, what a competitor, what a footballer, what a ball carrier, what pace, stamina, fitness, strength, feeling, play him anywhere, like, you know. Do, do you kind of feel like as, as time passes on, the new generations just, they don't even realise how good some of these players that you've named are, or were? I'd say they mightn't, but I believe Every, the game gets better. Every game evolves. Every game, I look at some of our matches there, which we thought we were great. But you, Jesus, you'd see, it was a case of fellas kicking in the ball, fight for your ball, like. Throw it up in the air and fight it, fight for it. Like, there's no such thing as giving you an advantage. Do you know? Whereas the game gets, evolves, it gets better. There's better feedback, better match analysis, better, no overtraining better mental preparation and I believe players get better as, as the decades go by and um, so the, what you're seeing now if that Dublin team that won the five in a row like that is the best team of all time you know you look at the players that they have there like you know they're serious there's uh, nearly caught a few times but weren't and fairness what brilliant manager and they brought a science into the game, not taken from their skill, they had the skill, but the big thing I think is that they brought that bit of science into the game where you only shoot from certain positions, you know, play the percentages, making sure you're never one and one at the back, you have an extra defender there the whole time, strategy for kickouts, you know, they just put the thinking of the game to a new level. And no, the other other teams are, are catching up. What about Paddy O'Shea then? I mean, his famous right hook is something that I always think of, and then you you hear so many it's great stories about him. That famous right hook that he gave out, or was it left hook? Was it his left hook actually? Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, was that Dinny Allen? Was it? Dinny Allen, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jeez. Were you ever on the wrong end of one of those? No, no. Very <laughs> seldom Paddy would 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 get get into that. Um, I think the story was that time that uh, that um, Dinny had said something. <laughs> Dinny said Dinny had kicked a point or two, and and supposed to have said, "Oh, they'll be taking you off shortly." And she used to like red rag to bull in. So he was he he was impulsive like that, you know. Um, but what a, I, I must say, I don't know. Do people realize how good a footballer he was? He was he had fantastic lip. He could, for a five foot nine to play midfield with Kerry, you know, and to compete there with the likes of Mullins and fellow six foot three, you have to be able to get off the ground to do that. But he had fantastic field though, and fantastic stamina, strength, natural strength, and beautiful kicker of a ball, you know, that punting to the forwards, that low tra trajectory. Oh, he, 
and free of competitive then, like, you know, is and, and fantastic, fantastic fun then when the matches were over, like, you know. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to ask you about that. Are, are there any kind of funny stories that you think of when, when, when uh, Paddy O'Shea is brought up? Jeez, the, I remember the day inside in the dressing room and he trying to motivate us as captain and he hops the ball down and, and it hits, hits the fluorescent lamp and shatters it everywhere. Uh, Paddy, I know they were over in England there. Um, with, he was with Liam Higgins, God be good to both him. Uh, and they were after an awful weekend of it and they were driving home and next thing, to just some more party, like they were driving down and next thing, anyway, dog ran out and car, dog over the car and party was just in his trance, kept driving on about 15, 15, 20 minutes later, not your lucky day spot. And kept... <laughs> Terrible, I know. Shouldn't even be laughing at it, but it just summed up the type of fella he was. Like the dog was fine, I think. <laughs> we let on the dog was fine, but he was that was just party, like you know. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, he, he was he was something else. He was. Were, were you surprised when he went on to manage the county, or did you think this is this is going to no. be Colin? Oh, he couldn't wait. I knew. He wanted that, like he wanted. He probably had carry football was everything to to uh, to him, you know. Because he was he woke up in the morning, first thing in his head would have been carry football, breakfast, dinner, tea, everything was, you know. He had that obsession, and you could see that he wanted to train carry at some stage, you know. Yeah, and must have been great then to watch him win that All Ireland. With. Uh, Oh, the first, sure. the first one as manager, of course. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was great, of course, like, you know, for him to achieve. And, like, we felt having such passion for Kerry football and then to do it as a player and to do it as a manager. So it was, it was great, yeah. Mm. Were you, were you, what did you think when you saw him taking over with Westmead? And, of course, it was that documentary afterwards. So we got to see what he's like in the dressing room. Yeah, it was great to, for everyone else to experience. But we'd have, we'd have experienced that. We knew him backwards, like, you know, um, massive passion, you know, um, but it was, it was great achievement to, to win a Leinster uh, with Westmeath, like, you know, it just shows you he had that leadership and that motivational skills mm. that were needed, like, and that madness. It must have been, I think it probably goes without saying how tough it has been to lose teammates over the years. I mean, John Egan passed in 2012 as did Paddy O'Shea and, of course, before that, Tim Kennelly horse in 2005. Just to, to see men that you kind of soldiered with pass away, like, that must be unbelievably tough. Oh, it is. When you, when you look back, all you, all you think of is, is the good times you had with them, like, you know? Mm. Um, like, I'd often... Uh, I've met um, Ty Kennelly and, and John Egan, son John, um, you know... Uh, party, you'd meet the lads and more and, and uh, you know, but all we think of is, is the good times, the good fun, the good crack, the good fun, but they should, they, they shouldn't be gone, like, you know, being honest, they're, they were too young, um, whether it was thinking they were invincible or what, you know, but it is just so unfortunate and what they've missed out and, you know, what they're missing out now, you know, but that's, that's life really, you know, but, um, all I have is, is good memories of them. Which is great, which is great. And, and then just a final word then on, on watching Kerry at the moment. Are you enjoying watching them? Do you think they're far away? Oh, geez, I love it. Still, still go to a match, come away all excited and dis love discussing it and still the, have the passion for a match, you know, and love now watching Kerry playing and seeing who's coming and who's, are they improving defensively? Are they, what way are they doing in attack? And just get a great thrill out of it still. And some great players, great young players coming in, Kerry. So we'll have, we'll have a lot of fun yet and enjoyable days, I think. I hope so too. Well, look, Bomber, I really appreciate you joining me and uh, best of luck to you and yours in the future. Jane, best of luck to you too with your, with your venture there, by And delighted to talk to you.